Good morning. Welcome to our online Sunday school lesson again. <clears throat> it's good to have you uh, watching in this morning. Uh, we thank God each week for each of you that uh, send us our notes and our encouragements to continue to do this lessons online. Uh, we're thankful for those of you that uh, get the opportunity to listen to them. Today is Sunday, July 17th, 2022. This is an online Sunday school lesson for Axel Bell Baptist Church out of Anderson. Of course, this is Johnny Smith with our, doing our teaching. The title of this week's lesson is called Hope. Uh, the teacher's book uh, explained that this week's lesson means focusing on God's purposes for our lives can bring you hope from despair. Johnny, uh, I put down what I call the Johnny title this week. Knowing God and having God in your heart should always give us hope. Uh, this week, uh, again, as I've done several times this quarter, I'm going to use a commentary's introduction uh, to introduce our lesson this week. <clears throat> again, the writer, and I want to give credit again to the writer of our commentary this quarter is Jerry Phillips, uh, which I've already credited, but credited several times before in our lessons. Uh, he mentioned this situation. Marion, after college graduation, uh, Fred and Lucy worked hard and saved all their life, saved all they could. They put off many pleasures, drove older cars, and took simple vacations so they could save more. Uh, they rarely ate out at fancy restaurants, seemed never to have any expensive clothing. Every step they made and every action they took <clears throat> was meant to be intentional in an effort to save so they could save some money for their retirement. They did this as they both worked steady jobs for over 40 years. As I studied this commentary, uh, I thought, you know, we've done the same thing. And I'm sure a lot of you that's listening in, and I know most of you that listen in every week, I have done the same thing over the years. Uh, me and my wife have done it for over 45 years while I was working uh, we never did anything fancy. We always took the simple vacations. But then you ask yourselves and, and uh, you, you think, uh, how does that, uh, is God in us sparing ourselves some things that we really would love to have so that we can prepare or get ready for the futures. Uh, I wanted to ask this week, and I had here maybe mention a thought, what other things could Lucy and Fred have done uh, to save over the years? Uh, and I began to think about some things that my wife and I have done, and I've heard others say, uh, I've thought uh, of eating at home most of the time and only going out to a regular restaurant maybe one time a week. We've done that for many years uh, in an effort to try to send our kids to college in an effort to try to save for our retirement. Uh, and then I happen to think of one other uh, and I used to think so much, uh, making your own clothes. Uh, my wife's mother used to do this a lot uh, you would find her in town on Saturdays or Fridays on the days that she wasn't working, looking over the new pieces of fabric at the stores uh, and making, and I can remember she used to make my wife her own dresses and they were always so sweet and simple. But how many of you have done those things? But let's get back to our story about Lucy and Fred. Then after they finally retired, the news from, doc, from the doctor hit like a ton of bricks. They were totally not prepared when the doctor told Fred, it's cancer. How could it happen? Fred thought he had done everything along the way. He had exercised regular, he had eaten regular, 
a regular checkup for part of his annual wellness routine, vitamins, uh, supplements, immunity, things he could do, eating vegetables, not eating fast foods. And they begin to ask, why him? Why now? Just as it was time to retire. Now it seemed that the doctor was sweeping their dreams away. They sat stunned before the doctor. Fred stage four cancer, they were told, had no cure. The treatments to try to extend his life would be expensive and would eat up their savings quickly, even with insurance. He would soon be unable to travel and would require home health, and eventually he would require hospice. After returning from the doctor's office, and this is what I want to share with you, how did Lucy and Fred react? Lucy went to her room and began to weep silently. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Fred opened his Bible. The Lord led Fred to Psalms 42. He read it, then he shared it with Lucy. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God. Fred and Lucy were believers. They had lived faithfully for Christ throughout their entire married life. During seasons of blessings, they acknowledged and praised God for being on their side. Now in their darkest hours, they refused to believe Jesus would forsake them now. Whatever happened next, they prayed, they would continue to always have hope in Jesus. I've known several folks in my life, some I work with, had the same thing happen that happened to Fred and Lucy. I had a very good friend uh, after just a few years working on the company where I work, on our maintenance crew who had worked over 40 years he retired one day and we gave him a retirement party and I was able to be part of the retirement party. All smiles, had no idea, but he found out within the next month that he had cancer and within another month he had been buried. I learned then and I still say, we need to have our belief and our hope in Jesus at all times. If you don't know him today, let me ask you, Take that step. Make Jesus your choice. If you don't know how, contact me. Contact Preacher D. I remember seeing a church sign that said, Try Jesus. If it don't work out, the devil will always take you back. Background for today's lesson. Last week we studied how God gave Elijah the victory in front of Baal's prophets and in front of King Ahab, who was the evilest of all evil kings before him of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, and his evil wife Jezebel, how they had won over her god Baal. The commentary said, it's amazing how quickly our mountaintop experiences can turn into a dry desert. Listen with me. First Kings chapter 19, the first two verses. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, talking about the meeting at the altar on Mount Carmel. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, go let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life at the life of one of them, that by tomorrow, about this same time, you, Elijah, will see what I am worth. Following his triumph over the forces of Baal, Elijah should have felt elated, should have felt proud, should have felt great. But he heard that Jezebel now, was after him. His faith in God had been proven out before all the people. Elijah had stood against hundreds of phony prophets and oversaw their destruction. 
Now Ahab reported what Elijah had done to his wife Jezebel, the queen. She was furious and she swore that she would soon get to Elijah and have him killed. Now, 1 Kings 19, verses 3 and 4. And when he saw that, what Jezebel had planned, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, Lord, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, hearing, what the, the, hearing the queen's threats, Elijah immediately ran for his life. He traveled south to Bathsheba. In his distress, Elijah cried and prayed for God to take his life. He sat down under a juniper tree and prayed, God, go ahead and take my life. Then I want you to see what happened when God heard his prayer. Verses 5 through 8 of chapter 19. As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the, on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid down him again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat and bread forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Like Lucy and Fred, God gave him an answer. God gave him hope. God sent an angel to provide him food and encouragement. After he prayed and went to sleep under a juniper tree, when he, he was awakened by an angel, there was a fire with a cake bacon, and beside his head was a cruise of water. Now let me ask you, as you're listening to me speak, I want you to think in your mind, how would you feel if you took a nap one afternoon, then woke up and there was no one around you, but the fire was hot, the cake was bacon, and there was water beside your head? How would you feel if you fell asleep and woke up to this picture? How would you feel? Well, I'll tell you how Elijah felt. It says in verse 8, he arose, he began to eat and drink, and there he met with God. Then God said for him to go. So he took a 40-day trip from the northern part of Israel to the southern part in Judah. Below the southern part at Mount Horeb, there he was to meet God again. Now, verses 19, chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. This is part of today's lesson, as I now have got you ready for. It is entitled, Alone with God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and beheld the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. They have thrown down their altar, thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am the only one left. And they seek my life also to take it away. During his flight from running from Jezebel, Elijah fled from the northern kingdom of Israel down to Judah to Mount Horeb, known as Mount Sinai. Now this normally would have took 12 days, but for Elijah it took 40 days and 40 nights. At the end of his journey, when he reached his destination, 
Seeking shelter, he entered a cave on Mount Horeb to hide from Jezebel. Once in the cave, Elijah desired and felt like it was time for sleep. So he went to sleep. During his sleep, he was interrupted by a divine interruption. Suddenly, the word of the Lord came to him. The scripture says the Lord came to him and spoke to him and asked, What are you doing here in this cave, Elijah? I'm sure Elijah felt small at this point because he had been running from Jezebel to get away, right away from them. And God began to speak to him about his actions. Uh, I want to make a point here. And the point is this. Let me share with you, there's not a single place on this earth that you can go where the Lord does not know where you are and that the Lord can't find you. There's a lot of folks that run from God and think they found that place where they're safe from God. After God asked Elijah, Elijah answered God. He replied and answered, God in his ways. I have been zealous for you, Lord. In fact, I, Elijah, have done all I can and have done everything you said. But your people, the Israelites, have abandoned your covenant. God, you promised David, if they would follow you, you would be their God. But now, your people have deserted you. The Israelites have torn down your altars against your preaching. They have killed your prophets, all except me. Lord, I'm alone here and I'm scared. I'm your single prophet left. And the ones who did all this evil are now looking to take my life. Don't forget now, Elijah is talking to the same God who took care of him during the famine and sent fire from heaven to burn up the altar at the time that Elijah called upon him. Now Elijah is acting like he cannot protest or protect himself from Jezebel. As I reflect here for a moment before we go to the next point, let me explain. Our world is changing. Our nation is changing almost every day, if not every hour. More and more people from many other countries are coming our way, either legal or illegal. They want our freedoms. We have to remember, as Christians, as these people come, we have to show all these people that there's only one true God. All the fox God, false gods that they're going to bring with them will not survive. The Bible says, I am the only God. In the end, God says he's the one that will still be here. I just finished a book entitled Signs of the Times by David Jeremiah. He says in today's world, Christianity is falling in numbers behind the Islam religion. We as Christians need to take our Christianity seriously. And we need to start preaching and teaching and sharing Christ to these people. To help them to urgently turn from their false gods. I love this next section. And the teacher's book entitled it, God's Whisper. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 14. And he said to Elijah, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a steel small voice and it was so when elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the ending entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said 
What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The note, this note was in the teacher's book. The Lord wanted Elijah to go forth and stand, come out of the cave and stand upon the mountain before him. Could God have went in the cave? Certainly, but he wanted Elijah to listen to him. And he wanted Elijah to see something. Elijah had fled to escape Jezebel and stayed in the cave. Now the Lord wanted to get his attention and stand before him. This mountain where Elijah was most likely, according to Bible scholars, the same mountain where the Lord met Moses 600 years earlier. So you may ask, how did the Lord get Elijah's attention? A great and mighty wind began to blow. The Bible says it rent the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces. Rent means tore. It tore the mountains and the rocks on the mountains in pieces. I have a question for thought this morning. Did this wind just happen on the mountain and just around Elijah? Or was this wind blowing on the whole earth? At any thought, the wind showed Elijah it was God's power. However, the Bible says the Lord was not present in the wind. Then after the wind, an earthquake Earthquakes are mentioned in the Bible several times. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, it says, In the last days, nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, and there shall be famines and pestilences, pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Here again, Elijah was alerted to the earthquake, but the Bible says God was not in the earthquake just getting his attention. After the earthquake, a great fire. And I, and I ask you again, as you listen to this lesson, imagine in your mind, you're standing on a mountain and you see all in the valley. Imagine Elijah standing on the mountain. I see the winds blow. He, I see the earthquake shaking and out across the lower lands and then he sees a fire a woods fire, a wildfire, and smoke from the lower lands begins to come up on the mountain. The Lord wanted Elijah's attention, but the Bible says he was not in the fire. After the fire, with all the noise, the wind, the earthquake, Elijah hears a whisper, a still, small voice. When Elijah heard the whisper, he heard, what are you doing here, Elijah? The teacher's book reminded me this week, do you remember the story in Genesis of Adam and Eve where God called out and asked, Adam, where are you? Did God know where Adam was? Did God know where Elijah was? Yes. And he asked in 13, Elijah, where are you? Uh, the Bible says Elijah hid his face with his mantle. Had to look that one up. A mantle is a cape worn to warn off the cold or the chilly weather. When he heard God's voice, he covered his head with it. Then he went out of the cave and stood on the mountain. He gave his best excuses there once again. God, the children of Israel have forsaken you, Lord. The children of Israel have torn down your altars. The children of Israel have killed all your prophets except me. And I, Elijah, am the only one left preaching your word. And he says, and they seek my life too. The final part of our lesson is entirety. Finally, reality sets in. Verses 15 through 18. And the Lord said unto him, go Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. 
And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou know it to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel-Malah, shall thou know it to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu shalay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall you, Elisha, slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. The Lord gives Elisha his directions. Some people say the Lord gave Elijah his marching orders. Go back where you came from, but this time go through the wilderness of Damascus. Once you reach Damascus, I want you to anoint, ha anoint Hazel to be king of Syria. I studied this week, Hazel was also not a man of God, but he was used by God to do his work. Also there anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king over the northern part of Israel, called Israel. Also there, I want you to anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be my next prophet. Then God anointed Elisha to follow these orders. It shall come to pass, says God, if anyone escapes the armies of Hazel, they will be slain. They will be killed by Jehu, who I want you to know it, to be king of Israel. Then, if anyone escapes Jehu, I want you, Elisha, to slay them. Now, let's keep up with our kings of Israel now. Don't forget this. Uh, you can see where I've written it down here, and I'm going to share this right here with you. Ahab, you remember, was the son of Omri. Jezebel was his wife, the evil wife, ruled the northern part of Israel from 874 to 853. Ahaziah, who was the son of Ahab, ruled from 853 to 852. Jehoram, which was the son of Ahab, ruled in 852. Jehu then overtook in 851 and ruled to 814. Jehoazaz was the son of Jehu. He took over in 814 and ruled to 798. Remember in, Je in Judah now, Asa, the son of Abijah, ruled from 912 to 870. Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, ruled from 870 to 849. Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, ruled from 849 to 842. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, ruled from 842 to 841. Now I say that to show you that the Bible is true. This is the real history of Israel and Judah. Then God tells Elisha, those that escape the swords of the army of Jehu, you will slay yourself. Many say it never got to that. God's message to Elijah was that those who deserve judgment would not be able to escape it. Some might think that they had escaped from that judgment, but they also would find their judgment later by another king. Finally, God assured Elisha by telling him, by the time you get back to where you came from, there will be 7,000 people left that have not bowed or worshiped Baal. Elijah had a thought that there were no people left in Israel that still followed God, but God assured him, and now he knew that Elijah, his messenger, was going to preach to people that would receive God's words. In conclusion today, let me assure you and reassure you, and I believe this, you can always have hope as Christians in God and that there is no other God. I've placed my life and I've placed my destiny in God and I'm going to follow him till I have no more breath left. Then I will be in heaven with him. 
I can assure you that Baal, Muhammad, Buddha, and all the other gods that people worship are false gods. In the Ten Commandments, there are two commandments that start out. The first one says, There shall not have any other gods before me. And that's with a little g. Second, there shall not have any idols or graven images that you worship except me, the true God. As I conclude, most of you know I traveled a lot in my 45 years with my company. Several times I visited a country where they worshiped Baal and Buddha. One visit there was an extended stay where I was there two or three weeks. During one of my weekends, a good friend of mine at the company, who was my interpreter, spoke English, said, I'm going to take Saturday and I want to take you on a road trip to show you some of China. I finally agreed with him and I took a road trip with my friend. Upon arrival at this park, I figured we were going to see the park where the largest statue of Buddha is now located. After being there in the park and walking around and seeing the flowers and the trees, had a good time with just walking and out in nature, beautiful day, I had no problem with it. I enjoyed the walk. But he asked me and I looked up and after about a thousand steps on top of this hill, I looked up and I saw at the top of the steps the largest statue of Buddha. He asked me, would you walk with me? I said, sure, I'll walk with you. So we walked these steps to the top. While we, when we got to the top, he had me stand in line for an over an hour to get to the place that was a semi, it was a circle around Buddha's feet. After getting in line, we were able to actually step out and walk around the bottom of the statue. While there, he had me stand in line with him to get around to the front of the statue. In order to make a walking trip around Buddha's feet, was something I really didn't want to do, but I went with him. For you see, I was a little bit nervous. If I got lost from him, I might not be able to find him back and work my way back home. As we stood in line, as we went around the circle and got around to the feet front, we got to Buddha's uncovered feet. He immediately rubbed his feet like all the other people where I was at. Then he told me, you need to rub Buddha's feet. Then he said, you need to rub it. It will bring you good luck in the future. I immediately give him the sign, I do not do. And told him, I cannot rub Buddha's feet. With the no sign, he asked, what would it hurt for you to rub Buddha's feet? I immediately thought of the second commandment. I gave him the arm signal to explain that I couldn't do it. I had been trained in my pre-Chinese trip not to take my Bible or share I was a Christian while there. So I just refrained. I think he knew by then that I did not worship Baal or Buddha and was not about to start. Today, do you have any other gods in your life with a little g? Do you worship any other idols like your job, your boat, other things that take you away from going to the house of God at the appropriate times? Sunday school, morning service, evening service, Wednesday night prayer meeting, Saturday prayer study. Do you have any other gods are reasons, are excuses that prevent you from attending those things? Do you worship any idols? Today, God proved to Elijah he was the only true God. Do you know that God for yourself? If you don't, I pray that you will get to know the true God. Today, as we close, I want to pray a special prayer for Brother Mark. Brother Mark, we're praying for you. A little enemy 
We pray for uh, that those fa that family will know soon if there's anything wrong with Emily that's preventing her from walking. Brother Andy, Miss Jan, Brother Danny, we're praying for you. We're praying for our church. We're praying for our nation, and we're praying for the world and its nations. I also ask you today to pray for the Deacon's Approval Committee and the Nominating Committee as we look forward for our new year. Father, we thank you today for this lesson. We thank you for showing Elijah that you're the only true God. We pray today that there be, if there's anyone out there that don't know you, that you will show them and get in their heart and put a burning in their heart that they'll want to know you as the true God. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we may be able to answer or to say this prayer and hear from you. Lord, bless our church. Bless the leadership of our church that they'll turn to God and always use your direction and your word and study your word that they'll know your word and know how to make God-led decisions. Forgive us of our sins. Bless us as we go forward. And we'll thank you and praise you for everything. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. See you next week.